What's up, party people? Um, today, I'm going to cover the last two big movements from the civil rights era, the civil rights movement. Um, you know, so far these past two weeks, we've talked about the African American civil rights movement, which is monumental. Um, we have the end of public school segregation and then the end of all segregation with the Civil Rights Act of 1964, as well as the Voting Rights Act of 1965, um, which ended poll taxes and literacy tests. So we're seeing African Americans get a lot more equality when it comes to voting and segregation. There's no more Jim Crow laws. Um, last time I gave a lesson, we talked about the second wave of feminism, uh, which is all about the the women's rights movement for health um, healthcare when it came to access to birth control and um, abortions, as well as equal pay with the Equal Pay Act of 1963 and equal opportunities in education with things like Title IX. So we've talked about a lot when it comes to civil rights. And as I mentioned in my last video, um, other groups saw the success of the African-American civil rights movement and figured, well, hey, maybe we can have some successes in equality too. If it worked for them, uh, maybe it can work for us. So that's why we had the second wave of feminism. That's also what brings me to the last two movements, um, which is the Chicano movement, which focused on Latin Americans and their uh, rights. And the AIM, or American Indian Movement, which focused on rectifying a lot of um, bad situations that the Native Americans had went through uh, in our history. So that's what I'm going to talk about today, starting with the Chicano Movement. And the Chicano Movement, as I mentioned, focused on rights of Latin Americans. And so during this time period, and a long time before, uh, Latin Americans were experiencing a lot of the same things as African Americans. Um, that's why, and I've mentioned this many times, that they use the term colored. You know, you would have the white school and the colored school, and the white water fountain and the colored water fountain. And the whole point of using the term colored was so that it could apply to everyone that wasn't white. Not just black people, but Latin Americans, Asian Americans, uh, Native Americans, anybody who wasn't white was technically colored. So they were also facing segregation, uh, but more probably... Impactful was the lack of job opportunities. It was very hard to survive as a person of color in the United States before 1970, really. And so the Chicano movement really kind of focused on immigration rights and working rights and citizenship rights. And it was led largely by this man in the picture with the red flag here. Um, that is Cesar Chavez. And Cesar Chavez was a lot like Martin Luther King. He promoted peaceful protest. He used the same tactics uh, as Martin Luther King uh, marches and even the tactics of Mohandas Gandhi, who used um, fasting, uh, like protesting, eating, and kind of like starvation to raise awareness to uh, the problems of the, the Chicanos. So um, he is compared to Martin Luther King a lot when it comes to the civil rights movement, or the Chicano movement. And like I said, they're facing a lot of the same discrimination. We serve whites only, no Spanish or Mexicans. This was a sign that you'd probably see out west in places like California or Texas or places that used to be a part of Mexico that had a higher Latin population. You know, here's a very stereotypical uh, racist tequila ad. Uh, one taste and you're not a gringo anymore. Now you're a Mexican with a big bushy mustache and a sombrero. You know, this is uh, the kind of stuff that you would see um, during this time that discriminated against Latin Americans. Um, so again, a lot of the same problems. Probably one of the biggest events of violence and discrimination in recent memory towards Latin Americans were the Zoot Suit Riots. Uh, this is what a Zoot Suit is. It's a really baggy kind of suit. Normally has a long chain with it. Um, and everything's really big, you know, big and baggy. Uh, this was a style that a lot of Latin Americans were sporting, especially in the 40s and 50s, and they kind of made it their own. You know, it was really only Latin Americans who were wearing this style of clothing, and they liked it because it, it made them feel good. You know, it's, it's a, a formal way to dress. It looks nice, 
and also it kind of set them apart from other people. It kind of empowered them and felt like, you know, a, a collective group. And, and despite being discriminated against, they were able to kind of have, feel good about themselves and have this cool style. Well, in 1943, there's some story about how a group of Navy sailors uh, were in San Francisco and came across a group of um, guys wearing zoot suits. Sorry, my dogs are barking. And um, a fight broke out. And that fight ended up into a riot. The police showed up. And um, the police ended up going after all the Latin Americans, all the guys in the zoot suits. Uh, none of the Navy sailors, as you can see here, holding all these clubs, getting ready to go around and beat these guys, uh, none of them got arrested. The only people who arrested were the Latin Americans, and they spotted them by those zoot suits. And the city of San Francisco, after this, actually outlawed zoot suits. Um, crazy to think about, but they said, you can't wear this style of clothing anymore, it's illegal. And that was just a way to discriminate against them. Um, so basically the point is they're facing a lot of hardship as well. Uh, another problem that they're facing is that of education. Um, a lot of Latin students were hearing, and, and African American students and Asian students, anybody else of color, um, they were hearing their history as, you know, America conquered this great land, you know, and they, the uh, Europeans conquered the natives and they conquered the Mexicans in the Mexican-American War. And they were realizing they were only getting white people's history. They weren't getting their history. You know, half of America used to be Mexico. Um, and so what about, what about that time period? And what about, you know, their history? And so in 1968, a lot of um, Latin American students uh, organized these walkouts, these school walkouts, where they ended up just getting out of class and leaving. And, you know, you can't have school if there's no students. Um, so again, another peaceful way of protesting. Um, we did a walkout at school, uh, I believe last year, to raise awareness about gun violence when it came you know, on the anniversary of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas shooting. Um, so similar kind of concept here, they're raising awareness about unequal opportunities in, in education. Notice the sign, Education Justicia, we want justice in our education system. Um, so some people, like Cesar Chavez, were inspired by Martin Luther King and used peaceful protest. Other people were inspired by Malcolm X and kind of took on his message of by any means necessary and self-defense. That's what we call the Brown Berets. Similar to the Black Panthers, you know, they kind of took on a militaristic uh, look and style. See these guys carrying guns and weapons. And again, the whole point was to defend yourself, uh, not take the beatings uh, from the sailors, you know, at the Zoot Suit Riots. Uh, or not taking the discrimination that they're faced and actually standing up for themselves and uniting. So a lot, again, a lot of inspiration from the African American Civil Rights Movement. Um, but when we talk about the Chicano Movement, Cesar Chavez is usually the most famous person you're going to hear about. Um, and so this video goes into a lot more detail about who he was. You know, Cesar Chavez was a um, poor farmer. He grew up uh, in America, his parents were immigrants, but he was born and raised in the United States. And he, his family had to work. Um, he wasn't able to go to school. So he spent much of his life uh, working on the farm, helping his parents. And, um, you know, the famous story about Cesar Chavez as a kid is, you know, he dropped out of school to help his parents uh, farm on this, I think it was a grape or lettuce farm. Uh, and they couldn't afford the rent. And the farmer said, hey, if you tend all my fields, you know, for free, uh, I'll let you stay uh, or I'll pay your rent. And so Cesar Chavez and his family spends like an entire summer harvesting this giant field of grapes or, or lettuce. And at the end of the summer, after um, cultivating all that, the landlord says, oh, no, sorry, we never signed a contract. Uh, you got to go. And so he grew up uh, facing discrimination, seeing the plight of his parents working for little pay or for no pay. And so he was inspired to fight against that. And he was all about helping farm workers because at this time, a lot of immigrants from South America and Central America ended up being farm workers. Um, so he organized boycotts. You'd see help farm workers don't buy red coach lettuce. They profit off of, um, 
you know, free labor from immigrants. Um, and because he was a citizen, you know, he wanted to help make citizenship easier for immigrants, but he also wanted to help those people who came legally and, and were citizens. So in 1986, he helped convince the president, Ronald Reagan, to enact this Immigration Reform Act, which made it illegal to hire undocumented immigrants, but it did grant amnesty uh, for current documented immigrants, meaning if you did come to the United States uh, illegally, but you started a family and you started working and you've been here for at least five years, then you can stay and you can become a citizen. So he was helping those who wanted to come to America, uh, making it easier for them to become citizens, while protecting those who were already here and making sure that they uh, could work and get a fair wage. So Cesar Chavez, very important uh, to the civil rights movement. Um, probably definitely going to see questions about him on any upcoming quizzes. So definitely uh, watch that previous video in the Nearpod and make sure we know that he was a peaceful protest activist helping immigrant farm workers. So um, today, uh, Cesar Chavez, unfortunately, he is he's dead, but uh, he is remembered as, like I said, kind of the leader of the civil rights movement. And uh, there's even a Cesar Chavez day during October um, for Hispanic Heritage Month. And uh, like I said, he's kind of like the Martin Luther King of the Chicano movement. Um, I love this mural. It says, you are not a minority. And we have a Latin American, it kinda actually looks like Che Guevara, who was Cuban. Um, but I love it because it's so true. Like, um, you know, the Latin community in America definitely is not a minority. Like, they're going to be the majority of Americans within a couple of years. Um, so this period of, you know, speak English in America and um, discrimination against immigrants, uh, I think is going to end up coming to a close in our lifetime because um, America's built off immigration. Like nobody here is native, barely any, you know, less than 1% of the population is Native American. So pretty much everybody here came from somebody else or their ancestors came from somebody else. And now we're starting to see that it wasn't, you know, majority of European immigrants, but now it's going to be a majority of Latin American uh Latin Americans. So times are changing. So the last thing I want to talk about today and for the civil rights movement in general is the American Indian movement or what is abbreviated as AIM. And this was all about helping Native Americans. You know, I've said it doesn't really matter what time period of history I'm talking about. If we're talking about Native American history, it's going to be bad. It's going to be depressing. And that's still pretty much true even when it comes to the Native American movement. Um, because time after time, they've had treaties uh, that were broken by the United States government. We learned about them being forced to go to those American boarding schools where they had to become Americanized. Um, the Dawes Act, which forced them to become farmers uh, and give up their tribal communal way of life. And, you know, even all the way back to Christopher Columbus, when he arrived, they basically slaughtered and uh, spread disease and, and are the reason why uh, Native Americans only constitute 1% of the United States population. So similarly to the Chicano movement and the feminist movement, Native Americans saw the 60s and 70s as an opportunity to also try to enact change. Um, so that's the basis behind the American Indian movement or AIM. Uh, they're trying to unbreak these treaties. All those treaties from back in the 1800s you know, that were broken, they want rectification for that. They want the land that they were promised. They want the money that they were promised. And really, they just want a better living for Native Americans. Because after the Dawes Act was passed, most of them ended up being just forced to live on these reservations. Reservations don't have a lot of good land for farming or production or really anything. Um, and that's why you have a lot of poverty and alcoholism on Native American tribes. Not all of them, but a lot of them, that tends to be the case. And it's not their fault. It's because of the situation that they were forced into because of the United States government. So uh, they also used marches to raise awareness. We have the longest walk in 1978. And holy crap, it really was the longest walk. They literally walked from California to the capital of Washington, D.C., 
uh, I think it took a couple months, but this long train of Native Americans walking across the country raised a lot of awareness uh, that they're still here. Like, hey, we're still here and we're still struggling. Um, and when they arrived in the Capitol, it was a big organization and, and demonstration outside of the Capitol building to say like, hey, we want treaties reopened. We want to talk about what we can do uh, to amend these, these broken treaties. Probably the most famous incident from the Native American movement, though, comes from the Wounded Knee incident. We learned about Wounded Knee way back in the beginning of the school year when we were first learning about Native American history. And Wounded Knee uh, is pretty much the end of Native American resistance. Uh, women, children, the elderly, they were all massacred at this site in North Dakota, South Dakota? Can't remember exactly which state Wounded Knee is in. Um, but they were massacred, and after that, most Native Americans kind of just agreed, okay, fine, we'll live on the, the reservations. But in 1973, um, this new tribal leader got elected, one who didn't really represent uh, the Native Americans living in Wounded Knee, so they decided to take it over, and they took over the tribe and tried to like force this new tribal leader out, who I think he had connections with the U.S. government or something like that. Um, but basically, they were holding the place hostage, and it actually took um, one of Nixon, President Nixon's men to go and talk to these guys about how they could end this takeover of the Wounded Knee um, Reservation. And I love this picture because you can see all these Native Americans with guns and stuff, kind of like the Black Panthers or the Brown Berets, escorting this U.S. government official, and he looks kind of nervous and scared you know he's surrounded by all these guys who uh are ready to you know let him know that they're not going to take this stuff sitting down anymore obviously we got a camera crew and stuff there wasn't a lot of danger but still these dudes were definitely in control and i think that's pretty cool seeing as you know their history is one of massacres and and killings and genocide by by european uh, immigrants um so you know, the Native American movement didn't really get accepted too well. Um, Wounded Knee was looked at as kind of like, oh, look at these, um, you know, bad people. They're uh, using guns and um, scaring people, and uh, they must not be any good. And an example of that is when this um, actress, I can't remember her first name, but her last name is uh, Little Feather, I believe. Um, she was a Native American actress, and Marlon Brando won, I think, an uh, Oscar for Best Actor uh, for The Godfather in the 1970s, but he refused to accept the award because of what was happening at Wounded Knee and because um, the American government you know, didn't care and Americans didn't really care. So he asked this actress to accept the award, and if you watch the video, you see she gets booed, uh, all just for saying, like, hey, Native Americans need help. And you can see most people are like, oh, boo, we don't want to help Native Americans. Um, so the AIM movement continues today. Uh, most recently, we had uh, the Dakota Access Pipeline in 2016 um, trying to be built through the Dakotas. And not just Native Americans, but people living in that community in general did not want this oil pipeline to be built. There was long days of protest. You even had Bernie Sanders out there standing with the Native Americans saying, we don't want this pipeline, don't build it. It's going to go through sacred American Native American ground. It's going to contaminate our, wa our water. And for months and months and months, people were out there protesting this pipeline getting built. And by the wintertime, you know, the Dakotas are extremely cold. You can see these giant piles of snow. Very cold over there. And in the winter, um, people showed up, uh, cops or I don't even know exactly who, some sort of law enforcement shows up, and they start spraying people with water hoses. Um, so if you get sprayed with water in, you know, sub-zero temperature, you're going to die of hypothermia. So a lot of these protesters had the option of stay here and die or leave. So they left, and the pipeline got built, and guess what? Um, it actually is contaminating water, and now they're talking about removing it. So maybe they should have listened to the protesters back in 2016. Um, but the point is, AIM's still around today, um, Native Americans are still around today, and there's still a lot that they need help with. Um, there are some successes of the Native American movement, though. 
Uh, they did eventually reopen negotiations with Congress. There was an act that was signed uh, in 1871 uh, which said, okay, no more treaties. We don't have to deal with Native Americans anymore. They're living on the reservations. That's the deal. Um, well, they were able to reopen negotiations with Congress. So now Native American tribes can you know, meet with Congress and, and help you know, get laws passed that will help their, their tribes and their reservations. Um, they also have a government office that's dedicated to helping Native Americans called the Federal Indian Relations um, and then we also have relief from past treaties. Some treaties that were broken have been rectified and money has been paid and land has been given back, although not enough, not as much as, as there should be. So there are some successes, however, they are still fighting uh, for some for equality. So that is the civil rights movement. Five different lessons each like over 15 minutes. Um, you know, this is really what you would be getting in class anyway. So if you've watched all these videos, uh, thank you so much. And, um, I hope they help. Here's a quick summary. You guys have the Nearpod to look at. Um, but pretty much everything I've mentioned at the beginning of the videos, lots of successes with the African American civil rights movement, lots of legislation, lots of people to know. Um, but really the Brown versus board civil rights act in 1964 and voting rights act. Voting Rights Act of 1965 are important to know for them. Um, and, you know, the civil rights movement really should still be going on today. Uh, I've mentioned this time and time again. You know, my parents are were born in 1962. Uh, segregation didn't end until 1964, okay? So I'm only 28 years old, uh, despite looking 35. But, you know, that's not that long ago. If my parents were born in 1962. That means my grandparents were like in their 20s in 1962. That means they grew up most of their life at that time living in segregation, living with, um, you know, the white school and the colored school. And my grandparents are still alive. And I'm sure your grandparents probably lived through this stuff too, at least some of yours. Um, so it's not that long ago. You know, to say that equality should just come about and, you know, uh, there's no more problems that people of color should be complaining about. It's just ignorant. Um, it's going to take some time for equality to really come about. Uh, and even, you know, what is this, uh, 60 years now? Uh, we're, we're still trying to work on that. So uh, racial problems are still here in America. It's getting better every day, though. And um, there's still some issues left over from the civil rights movement that we can address and hopefully use our youth and energy and uh, camaraderie to, to fix. So as always, guys, um, email me with any questions. I have uh, one more assignment for this week. If you click next, we're looking at some uh, movements from the or documents from the Chicano movement. And um, on Friday, we're just going to do a practice review. It'll be a mustard day. You guys can try to catch up on work. Um, and to be honest, I'm not going to check the module until Monday morning. So you really got the whole weekend to work on everything. So if it's been a lot, I apologize, but I'm giving you guys some extra time. Again, going to be really lenient with grades and stuff. So um, just email me if, if there's any questions or concerns. And I hope you guys are doing well. I miss seeing you guys. Uh, looks like we got another month. <laughs> Uh, of this, or at least two weeks, because um, I'm recording this in the past. But, um, yeah. Okay, bye.